Hi, I'm Joanne Hillman of the Winthrop Cultural Council, and I'm also working with a group called Winthrop Loves Trees. And we had a fundraising event, and we did an exhibit here called Trees, Trees Exhibit, and we had several local artists participate and um, donate um, monies to pay for some trees to be planted. In the other room, we have a plan a landscape plan for the town landing. It has 10 trees and we're hoping we can make that happen. And we need for that, just for that piece, we need $10,000. The event on August 7th, which was well attended, um, raised uh, approximately $2,500. So we're getting there. Um, trees are, are expensive, so if you would like to donate and help these goals, which one of which is the boat ramp, Plan. It's referred to as the boat ramp plan. Uh, the other is we want to plant uh, tre more trees at Ingleside. We'd also like to replace a lot of the trees that have come down already. And in addition to that, we uh, want to do some landscaping, um, some neglected areas in Winthrop that have, uh, you know, invasive species taking over. We want to clear that out and plant native plants there. So these are some of our, our bigger goals. And um, if you want to help out, you can make your check payable to Winthrop Loves Trees and uh, find us on Facebook. We also have a, a PayPal account that you could use. Uh, the, the, this event, this particular exhibit was well attended and it was lovely. And um, we hope you join us the next time we do something like this. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out to hear Frank Costantino speak about his beautiful watercolors and the process and the inspiration for drawing them. Uh, so if, it, if anyone doesn't know who Frank Costantino is, here he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the message. Again, that's, that's rooting me down, if I might say. You know. uh, but I've been a resident of Winter for a long time, over 60 years, uh, having moved here as a child. Um, my art training was really self-acquired in that I didn't go to art school, I went to study architecture. Although, since I was a kid, I always did drawings and cartoons and things of that sort and you know, began to uh, follow that interest, uh, particularly after high school and deciding on you know, where the real world lies and what kind of education I should follow, which ended up being in architecture. So my basic training is actually in architecture, in architectural illustration. Uh, doing some design work, but mostly illustration for all kinds of projects all over the world. Uh, from that, developing techniques in drawing in pencil, uh, in charcoal, in watercolor, and color pencil, I was able to get develop the interest in doing watercolor painting. Uh, uh, some architectural illustrator friends of mine were uh, into what they call plein air. And plein air was a, uh, a sort of new evolving movement, at least in this country. Uh, and there were many events around the United States where they would invite artists. Art, some artists had to qualify for these different events, by the way. But uh, some of these artists were uh, invited to participate in plein air events. Uh, so that put my studio work that I had my own kind of time frame to produce for my architectural commissions to then work in the field, on the spot, and be able to create paintings and drawings of uh, subject matter that were particular to a, an area where this plein air program was being held. So in the case of this particular illustration, which is one of my largest plein air paintings, because it's very cumbersome for one thing to paint on the spot outside, uh, but this is a full sheet, a 20 by 30 sheet. Uh, this was one of uh, three or four paintings that I had done in a plein air event in St. Simon's Island in Georgia. It was an event that I had qualified, got accepted by, and drove down and participated with a number of other artists, many of whom I began to know quite well, others were friends of mine, and we basically had the run of the town to go anywhere in this seashore community uh, to be able to paint you know, some of the enticing subjects, or whatever subjects appeal to us, uh, in order to represent their community. Uh, in the case of uh, this instance, this is actually a village square that is adjacent to a waterfront uh, dock and uh, walkway area uh, in St. Simon's Island. Uh, and this is just outside the village area. There are some municipal offices in the background. But obviously what struck me was the appearance of a lighthouse, uh, which you can see here, uh, in the background seen through 
the entwining limbs of this live oak. And I had seen other live oaks in other places, but down there, because of the humidity, you know, and the environment, these live oaks were just spectacular. And, and this thing was just trailing over and down into the ground, which you can see here. So part of the, part of the uh, skill set that I acquired in doing work from drawings, architectural drawings, and designs, and then using those documents to be able to create perspectives, I had a sense of you know, how to compose uh, the views that I wanted for the architect's uh, illustrations. And that worked very well for me in being able to isolate out of a very large vista of what was seen in the square to be able to isolate and create a view. Composition is very important in how one positions the elements that one likes to uh, describe or what is attracted, you know, attracting the artist. Uh, so composition is a key thing. Uh, another factor I should bring into account is as I was uh, doing my perspective illustrations for architects, I was also teaching seminars at the Boston Society of Architects, teaching the watercolor techniques and methods, but also teaching perspective drawing. Uh, I taught perspective drawing at Rhode Island School of Design, at Harvard uh, uh, Graduate School of Design, and also at the Boston Architectural College. So the grounding in perspective methods, knowing how to draw, how to see proportion, how to be able to compose uh, your, your subject matter, those are all instinctive for me anyway. So taking all that skill set that I acquired from both the teaching and my professional practice and bringing it out into the field, so to speak, was an easy transition for me. So that's how I was able to get you know, images that you know, were done right on the spot where you know, there was no second try in doing these kinds of drawings. Okay? So, uh, this is uh, the result of a lot of years of sort of preparatory work and training to be able to do something like this. A lot of the other artists that would come down uh, to do this kind of work were trained in fine arts. Um, the, uh, they may or may not have had similar type of experience. Uh, and the, 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 the telling point of being able to sort of get recognition from jurors uh, in these particular events because all these events have jurors, A, for acceptance to be a part of it in the first place, because it's a, it's a national call for artists to be able to come down to these plein air events, and then also to have a, you know, produce quality work that the jurors of awards, which could be a separate group of people, the jurors of awards then, you know, select for a second and third, like Joanne and the Art Association does here um, for the Art Festival. So in the same way, uh, the uh, other work that I had done, which is an old carriage house that happened to be a restaurant, but was also being threatened to be sold and to be torn down, was a, an image that I had created. Uh, again, architecture seems to be part of the subject matter that appeals to me, although uh, in this instance all the subject matter has either trees or tree-related uh, subject. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the other image uh, that did win a prize uh, out of 30, I think it was 40 different participants in the plein air event uh, was pretty significant. It also came with some cash, which was, that didn't hurt. <laughs> and the piece sold, which also didn't hurt. But um, the, the, the fact that I uh, understand about architecture and space and depth and perspective, uh, layering, values, you know, all of these different things that are part of what an artist does, and sometimes an artist does it instinctively, is something that I acquired in doing my illustration work, in my own drawing and sketching and whatnot. So anyway, so this is pretty dynamic, I thought, and uh, I had done a uh, similar to Live Oaks in other places around the country. Uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, I conducted another seminar where they had another Live Oak that was just outstanding. Uh, it was, in fact, part of a, uh, a, a well-known museum in uh, Jacksonville, Camarat uh, Art Museum, uh, and I did a similar painting uh, in, in that scale. Anyway, the idea is, is uh, you know, to be able to understand about the color, because seeing a subject and then translating the color of that subject and the kind of light, you know, shadows are coming down in here, shaded area back here, some dimmer light in order to create the sense of distance for the lighthouse way in the background, which is one of their iconic elements, you know, similar to Boston Light here in the harbor. This is, I can't remember the name of the lighthouse, but it is one of a series going down the coast. Uh, and then uh, towards the end, uh, a, uh, an architect friend of mine who happened to retire down to St. Simons and who put me up for a night and reconne rec reconnected after many decades, actually, uh, and said, well, you know, maybe this could use a figure in here. And he was absolutely right. So some guy came in here for, you know, on his phone for, you know, like a minute or a minute and a half. So I quickly sketched him in, and then finally I sort of, you know, interpreted him to fit in with the rest of the coloration in the palette. Uh, I'll talk about some of the other uh, uh, decision-making that comes into doing the plein air work. 
uh, and also explain about what I use for a palette and brushes in order to do that. But uh, so this is you know one of the uh, one of the many pieces that I was able to do down uh, St. Simon's Island during that particular planar event. So if uh, the transition is not too difficult, you know we can go into the other room and I have another eight pieces or nine pieces there to talk about as well. So. <coughs> I don't know. I, I actually have a, a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, study uh, lessons that have actually been recorded and put on YouTube. I have a series of uh, four different series and painting trees on YouTube, uh, and they go from you know a real basic type of washes and how to work wet on wet. Uh, watercolor is a specific difficult medium to work with, uh, which is uh, what I taught myself. I really didn't have any watercolor lessons when I, when I was in college or when I was first apprenticing in architectural firms. So understanding what the technique was, realizing its appeal to me personally uh, was something that you know I wanted to find out more about uh, and the, the, the watercolor skill set developed over a period of time and continued practice and study and some of which early on was at the expense of my clients, right? They didn't know what I did. They didn't know what I didn't know. So, and I wasn't going to tell them either. So when they wanted a watercolor illustration, sure, why not? <laughs> so, anyway, um, but I, sequentially, this is, this is a bit more recent. I had done this in conjunction with the New England Watercolor Society, of which I've been a, a longtime signature member. And uh, we, uh, I was invited by the president. Uh, she's still president now, as a matter of fact. No, she ran a three-year term. Anyway, invited by the president, uh, and, and her having known my participation in plein air events around the country, uh, to uh, come up with a program of plein air painting for New England Watercolor Society members and or people that were interested in painting out of doors and maybe becoming members of the New England Watercolor Society. So in this case, uh, only two of us showed up, the president and myself, at the Arnold Arboretum. <laughs> but it was so spectacular there, because I hadn't been there for quite a long time. And this copper beach, which was uh, set in the background and overlaid with this humongous branch of a, I think it was a maple, if I remember correctly, and some of the beginning leaves that were coming out. Because it was early spring, I think it was in late April, early May. So it was you know, a real, you know, uh, very effusive time of nature. Um, so again, this was painted on the spot uh, in, uh, again, the overlaying of the, of the different colors was something that attracted me. Uh, not only do I regard you know, copper beaches as magnificent trees, and we do have some here in Winthrop, which is uh, terrific, uh, but it's just the, 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 the way, the interaction of these native elements that really struck me. So devising a composition where you have a large branch in here, uh, had, leading the eye you know, into the area, the central area of interest, which happens to be in the background, right? So what the, the subject matter that is of interest is in the background of this particular composition. So layering stuff in a way that suggests depth, e even though there, there aren't many elements to give you a sense of depth, you know, became part of the instinctive work in being able to execute this piece. So and again, this was done live and on the spot. Uh, I want to point out that this is this is the easel that I carry around. Uh, it, it collapses down. It's called a half easel, a French half easel. Uh, it's somewhat light, although as I get older, it's getting heavier. And uh, but I set it up with uh, the the panels that I need in here. You know, something of that size is mounted on a on a rigid board. That rigid board then has the uh, the, the paper that I use. And I work on a variety of different papers. I don't know how many, how many people actually work in watercolor or do some kind of work in watercolor. No, okay. Well, then maybe a good point. Anyway, I work on different surfaces of watercolor paper. And this is the travel set that I uh, that I work with. Uh, in fact, the most recent one was done at the uh, done at the uh, Public Gardens in Boston. Again, for the New England Watercolor Society, I was heading up a group that were going in onto uh, various places ar around New England, and I was at the uh, Public Gardens, so I ended up painting an accordion player on the footbridge going over this one yeah. long pond. So, so anyway, this is, you know, a, a not atypical of the palace that you would see with fine artists. You know, there's a big round things with all their paints around. So this is basically what I use. You know, I moisten these, moisten these uh, uh, various uh, pigment segments up uh, with water and then I go from there. Uh, these are some of the, the brushes that I use, you know, different sizes uh, in order to be able to paint freely and be able to get uh, the subject matter down. Um, different, uh, different types of flat brushes, for example, you know, like so. Yeah. Uh -huh. All different uh, sizes for different uh, the idea, The idea of plain air is that it's intended to be a fresh, fresh paint is another term that's being used by different events. 
Uh, you know, and it, that's what it means, is that you're going into a location, you're going to be painting right on the spot and finishing a piece of work in, you know, X number of hours or minutes, whatever it is, okay? So some, most of the oil painters that I know uh, working in these plein air events, you know, will work at an 8 by 10 size, fairly small, you know, maybe something like that size or this size. And it's surprising that, you know, because they're working with oils and they also have a method and a technique for being able to, you know, build up their colors and values and whatnot. It's a, it's a, it's a whole different process. They, the the uh, oil painters work from dark to light, whereas the watercolors work from light to dark, okay? So they want to preserve the whiteness. For example, on this piece, which is done in Central Park in New York City, uh, the white is actually the white of the paper. So in sketching out the subject matter and being able to say, I want this view of a fountain, and I have to admit that you know some of this was inspired by some of John Singer Sargent's paintings of fountains in Italy, by the way. Okay. So Sargent's my, you know, he's he's the he's the, the deity of watercolor, among others, okay, that I study, you know, uh, in in fact have replicated John Singer Sargent. I've taken some of his works, reversed the image, and then repainted it to understand, okay, how did he do this and you know, be able to get a sense of, you know what he was doing. Nonetheless, that was, you know, infusing some of the work that was done here. Uh, and again, using some of the brushes that you see here, you know, to get a, you know, one pass of a multicolored wash for the background trees, but also very carefully using some of the smaller brushes to protect the fountain spouts up here, to protect the statue, the, the, uh, the, the standard, uh, the, uh, the trident of the uh, Neptune god at the top. Uh, again, working with contrast of light to dark, but yet having shade on a lighter surface. I mean, there are, these are the kinds of visual problems that uh, illustrators, architects, artists, you know, deal with all the time, okay? And, and then how do you pull that all together with all of these different values in order to make the subject, you know, attract the eye, be the focus of the composition, which in this case is off to the center, right? So the comp how to set up a composition so that you don't have a subject matter that's right smack in the middle of a, of a uh, piece of work or your drawing uh, is another, uh, another skill set that requires you know, some sophisticated uh, understanding and a connection. I mean, that, in plain air, you know, you're out there in the field and you're, you know, you're attempting to produce as much work as possible and uh, be able to uh, you know, have quality work that a juror is going to recognize or that a buyer is going to buy, right? Doesn't matter if you win an award. If you sell your work, that's yeah, that's <laughs> worth it, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's what they all go for. But that's another story. So anyway, <clears throat> so the, the idea is that you know, using the different devices, a lot of which is instinctive. Okay, for me, it's instinctive because I've done this work in perspective and illustration for a long, long time. So I have a sense of you know how I can frame a view that's like this, right? So we're we're dealing with the panorama of our vision as we go into a particular spot. And then to be able to, uh, you know, isolate that in order to fit a portion of that on a piece of paper at that size and scale, and where does stuff go? Okay, that's a whole other skill set that you know comes with practice. Okay, uh, I'm a big, big advocate for drawing. I keep many, many sketchbooks, uh, a lot of which I've done, you know, just quick and free, loose sketches and whatnot. But it's also a good skill to keep the eye sharp, keep the hand sharp, and be able to deal with these these questions of composition. And also the other thing uh, about uh, uh, work like this, uh, and what's challenging is, is the movement of water. I've, I've painted a lot of scenes with water and ocean and um, riversides and docks and what have you, uh, so that the water became a, a particularly important thing. You can see some of the reflection of the water uh, spouts coming down into the main basin in here, you know, picking up in here. Some of the reflectivity of the water that you don't see up on the middle basin, you know, back up on the underside of the basin up here, you know, and then the, of course the, the fountains in, in the uh, in the upper part as well. Uh, so you know, this is this is fairly loose, although you know the strokes are you know quite. Definitive. I mean, I, I put them in there, and that was it. You know, I mean, it's basically a one-shot deal. In some cases, they were underpainted layers. You can see there's, you know, an orange color in here that's overlaid with a blue, and then more of the blue as you get closer to the wall here. Uh, the idea of reflected light on a surface. You know, these are all things that we see. That we, but translating that into paint, whether it's watercolor or oil paint, you know, that's a whole different, you know, process and selectivity and familiarity with one's palette. Whatever the, the 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 color palette here, obviously, is much brighter. It's uh, you know the yellow versus the green and the blue, whereas that you know is the red and the green. So that the the, the one for the Arnold Arboretum is a uh, complementary color scheme. 
is basically red and green, you know, Christmas colors, but that was what was there, right? But it's done in this way. So then, and, and then the other thing is, is working with the values in, in the shapes of, of uh, secondary elements. So, you know, this shape, which is the shadow of trees and the shadow of this wall and the pineapple on top, you know, becomes a leading element. So you have the, the perspective coming in this way, and then the leading element of the shadow on the ground, which is really quite secondary, but in fact, it all helps to reinforce the, 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 the off-center placement of this particular fountain in this composition. So I'm particularly pleased with this one. I had done a similar one of Brewster Fountain in, in uh, Central Park, uh, which ended up in Maine. Uh, a, a collector up in Maine uh, purchased that. So. But I particularly like this one because of the richness of color and the depth and, you know, the sort of, the, just the, the, the liveliness of it, okay? And the fact that it does not, not even close to what Sargent had done for some of his fountains, but at least it was a start you know, to get to that level. So. Uh, by the way, if any of you have you know, questions on any of the work as I'm talking, yes. So um, I'm familiar with Sargent as you know painting in oils. Are yes. you talking about his oil paintings as far as you, or did he actually do watercolor? Oh, oh yeah, he did watercolor. Oh okay, he, he, I didn't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Sar Something Sargent was Sargent was an extraordinary watercolorist, okay. uh, and why most watercolorists know of his work, um, and uh, you know is is really a. A, a high point of reference for people that work in the watercolor arts. Uh, other other artists of you know uh, comparable stature, obviously, is J. M. W. Turner, although a bit more abstract, a bit more impressionistic. Okay, in fact, he was the father of impressionism, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, J. M. W. Turner was also one of the first high-profile artists coming from England that uh, was really instrumental in starting the plein air movement. And one of the reasons for that was the technological development of the day, which was getting paints into tubes. <laughs> transportable tubes because prior to that, you know, with, with the Dutch masters and with the Italian Renaissance masters, they ground their own paints, their own oils, you know, and that took a long, long time. That's why, you know, Vermeer's 34 paintings, which is what he produced during the course of his, of his lifetime, and he died in poverty, okay, left his family adrift with no money, but his 34 paintings were done with his special grinding of pigments and the way that he layered them on is what makes his paintings so, you know, incredibly you know, ex they make it exceptional and so incredibly valuable, okay, in the multi-millions of dollars. Um, in the same way with Van Gogh. You know, Van Gogh, w once these two paints were developed, and J.M.W. Turner, along with other Englishmen, um, uh, uh, I'll think of a name in a minute, but anyway, some of his contemporaries in England were the ones that first go out and actually paint the sketches on site. And he was very, very successful at doing that. And that also uh, created the opportunity to be much looser because their impressions, their suggestions, their studies, if you will. And Turner was able to get, you know, this, uh, this, this work, you know, as, as a uh, preparatory study for his oil paintings, which were also impressionistic. But, you know, he just, he was on his own path and he went in a, uh, an incredible uh, a new direction as far as, you know, art expression was concerned. And that in turn led to the Impressionists, okay? So towards the end of his life, in the uh, sort of 1830s, 40s, that in turn led to the emergence in France of the Impressionist movement that happened uh, at that time as well. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that with, with Sargent, you know, he wasn't the only one doing watercolors. Uh, James McNeil Whistler, who was a contemporary with, with Sargent, was also exceptional in watercolor and oil. Ian de Zorn, uh, a Swiss artist, uh, who was considered the Swiss Sargent, although in Switzerland they considered Sargent uh, the, the, American Zorn, the American Zorn. I don't know if anybody had seen Ian de Zorn exhibit at the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum um, maybe three or four years ago. It was just extraordinary, okay, uh, in, in his watercolor work. Ian etchings as well. Uh, Zorn was a bit more accomplished in that he was very skillful in doing etchings as opposed to Sargent who never did that. Sargent's just stuck with the oils, his portraiture, and his watercolors. Um, There's also a phenomenal show of Sargent's watercolors at the MFA about three or four years ago. It was just works that I had never seen before. It was just amazing stuff. So anyway, so these are the guys that I studied, okay, and uh, among others, okay, we have Winslow Homer here. Uh, Winslow Homer, who was uh, an illustrator, you know, he did illustrations during the Civil War, pen and ink drawings of, uh, you know, soldiers up in trees, you know, shooting people down, and the, you know, the Union soldiers, you know, uh, uh, averting the, you know, Confederate charges, etc. And then he graduated into uh, watercolor work and uh, ended up in Presque Isle, Maine, where his studio is now a National Historic Site, and you can visit, you know, his studio, which is which had been recently restored, maybe four or five years ago. I've yet to get up there, but. Uh, so Homer is another one that is, you know, uh, a, a reference point, and I have all these artists that, whose work I look at all the time in order to inform what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, uh, as an example of you know sketchbook drawing, uh, you know this was uh, a, a piece that was done at the intersection of uh, Route One and I think it was uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the roadway that goes down towards Perkins Cove in Marginal Way. But uh, nonetheless, I was standing there basically because my wife was doing some gift shopping, so <laughs> <laughs> I had my sketchbook and I was just struck by the awnings of, of this particular house, which was across the way, right on Route One, some little gift shop. And it was a uh, you know, just a nifty little uh, you know subject uh, study, uh, working with contrast, working with just line, and I, I put in the the blue warning color um, for that particular sketch. But because this was going to be a tree show, I added in some of the suggestion of green color to bring out the the white roof area and the focus on the building. Although you know the trees were certainly a significant part of this particular view, so I thought it relevant for uh, for the tree show. By the way, I brought all these pieces in because it was my understanding in, in knowing Joanne and what she was trying to do here in the, uh, the newly formed uh, tree advocate group that you know, it was going to you know, show as much stuff as possible, get people in Winthrop excited about trees again, uh, and, you know, and, 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 and really get more hands-on vested concern about what our tree sylvan environment was in the, in the town. And I, I think bringing in as much as many examples as possible, I thought was going to be relevant. So I, I was uh, very shocked to see this many works, and uh, not quite so many from others. Although uh, uh, Sylvia McNeil brought in uh, quite a, quite a number of uh, beautiful photographs as well, which is great. So um, anyway, so this is an example of the kind of you know a sketchbook. And I have multiple sketchbooks uh, at this size. Uh, <coughs> some that are nine by twelve, which is the size of the inner frame in here. Uh, and I do, you know, drawings of all different subject matter. Uh, I've been drawing my kids since they were babies, uh, so that's, you know, 60 years. No, my son is 50 years old, so 50 years worth of drawings of my kids, you know, which is when they were little ones, uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, and the drawing is, is really an important part for being able to, you know, isolate those views that are in the environment or, you know, within your own home. And that becomes uh, a, a vehicle for, you know, not only learning about a media, learning about the particular hand technique that you want to develop, but also for being able to, you know, see the relationship of different elements, to be able to then create a composition of those elements that attract you, to be able to then, you know, bring them into a drawing. That, you know, it could be only for personal stuff, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be anything that representative, okay, because the you know, modern artists, for example, you know, they, they turn that into a, a cube or something, you know, I mean, <laughs> then there's the, that whole interpretive impressionistic approach that, you know, is, is a, a whole other genre. So this, the work that I do is pretty much representational, although I've been loosening up with other types of work, which I have um, been showing at uh, John Munson's Beacon Galleries up on Winthrop Street. So he's been uh, good to work, good enough to work with me and show some examples of uh, smaller abstract studies that were in watercolor, you know, five by seven, yeah, about that size. And I'm working on some other ones that are nine by twelve, about the size of this. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, this is a uh, another because I've been uh, had the opportunity to travel uh, either on vacation or working with these plein air events. I've been to plein air events. Uh, you know, from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast, and I uh, had an opportunity to paint in, in Monhegan Island in May, or Monterey Bay, California, or in Montana, or in Maryland. You know, I mean, it's really fantastic to have those, the, the, that opportunity. So in this case, this was up in, um, uh, in Rockport, and it was just this little vista. In fact, that's my wife walking down. I think we were going towards the water uh, and behind where the uh, you know, commercial area is. And it was just, you know, this tree sticking up in here, this, this little house in the background. And it was just, it was a you know, very appealing scene. You know, it conveyed a, a comfort level, the relaxation that my wife was enjoying at the time. And uh, maybe she wasn't relaxed because I was painting <laughs> and she was walking alone. I don't know. We never actually discussed that, but, you know, she, <laughs> why did you put me in the painting? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a nice moment. She wanted to get yes. to the shops. Uh, she wanted to get to the shops. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like she did up in Oconquin. Yeah. This, yeah. <laughs> see, Maureen knows. <laughs> it's a woman thing. Yeah. 
Anyway, so yeah, so I, I, I thought, you know, since it was this, you know, isolated, a single isolated tree that, you know, was sort of gnarled and growing on its own, but it was part of that coastline. It was part of what made Rockport what it is, right? And why people go to Rockport to visit, you know, to enjoy that shoreline that is different in its contours and its appeal than it is, you know, here in Woodford, right? So uh, anyway, so that was the, uh, you know, a quick little sketch. And again, it was done, you know, uh, that one I think was done on a small pad on an easel like this and using my, uh, my, my paint palette. Uh, and again, the other thing about working with any medium, you know, whether it be watercolors like this or oils or, or pen and ink, is, you know, finding that comfort level, you know, something that you can you know, almost almost uh, uh, use the medium without really looking at it. You know what these colors are doing, you know how these colors are going to interact one with the other. I mean, these are the things that are part of a learning curve that comes only with practice. And that practice, you know, can only happen when you do stuff like this. And it can be abstract or it can be very loose, you know, just splashing around like kids do, right? When you talk to kids about watercolor, they don't care, you know, well, this is a sedimentary color and that was transparent and this was a light chroma and that was a high chroma. So, you know, they want to just get out and they just want to play around, right? So that's the thing that, you know, we want to get over those kinds of barriers and just play around with something that you're really interested in. And then, you know, you develop, you know, a skill set and a dependability that comes from this kind of, you know, the kind of work that you want to do in a particular medium or in a particular venue, like a plain air event, in order to be that skilled and that good at it. So <clears throat> this is another example of a, um, uh, again, a, a sketch. You can guess my what my wife was doing at the time. Uh, and uh, we were down vacationing on Nantucket Island. And I've done many uh, drawings and paintings of Nantucket, by the way, because uh, we vacation there uh, every year. And uh, this was at the end of Main Street, and this was an old, um, uh, an old theater uh, building, and it was just with the, the, I think it was a late vacation, or I can't remember now, but anyway, it was, uh, the, the leaves had fallen, and it was, you know, basically bare branching, but I like the, the superimposition of the tree forms, the curvilinear tree forms against the, you know, the structure in the framing of the architecture of a, you know, fairly formal building, probably from the 1850s, that was uh, at the end of uh, uh, Main Street there. Uh, and then, you know, brought in a typical, you know, light standard that, you know, identified the era in the sort of ambiance of Nantucket Island uh, and just tinted a little bit of the orange with the blue to give it that complementary color scheme, but just enough to make it, you know, uh, the tree, you know, hold its own against the larger portion of the composition, which is the building itself. Uh, so these, uh, again, I work in... Uh, Different colored pencils for different subject matter uh, in order to express what the uh, what the subject is that I'm drawing and you know give some liveliness to it rather than just in black and white like I did here. So uh, again, it's part of the experimentation and something that I really enjoy. So, um, so this is probably a uh, two thirds the size of a full sheet uh, uh, watercolor painting, um, and uh, as compared to the one in. Uh, in the, the first painting that was done in St. George's Island. Uh, and I had done this in Marblehead. Uh, I participated for probably the last seven, eight years, ten years, uh, for an invited event with other plein air artists by Gene Arnold from Arnold Gallery, who has his, has his business in the center of Old Town in Marblehead. And he's been carrying on this tradition for quite some time. And uh, this was done at the, uh, in uh, Marblehead Neck, uh, looking towards the harbor area, which is back in here. Uh, at the Eastern Yacht Club, and it was a view that was uh, very early in the springtime. You could see some of the, the leaves starting to come out here. Uh, and, but what struck me was this, this glancing morning light that was coming across this lawn. It was just like totally, you know, brilliant emerald color. And it was just, uh, just the vegetation, you know. And, and there's an indication of a uh, stairway coming from a residence, which is suggested back here, down to the water's edge. Uh, along a pier uh, in, the, in the corner, set in the background. Um, so it really was just a study on different colors of green. For me, that was really the purpose of this, this uh, composition, was to you know, see about the different greens uh, and the contrast between the highlight lawn area and then the strong shadow cast by the shrubs in here. Uh, but what, what uh, I found, uh, my learning curve for this particular piece was the sort of the, the, the quickness in which I was able to do this and also the the mark making that was uh, pretty much a one-off expression. You know, I didn't really work. You know, these colors. I made the decision, and then this is you know, the sky was put in first, and then the the uh, the, the colors of the trees, the, the structure, the branching of the trees was done next, and then the leaf patterns were just put in. You know, so it's just sequence, 
very deliberate and very finished sequence all in one step. Uh, and the same thing in here. As you can see, the, the shapes and the forms were all done fairly loosely, um, and, uh, but yet there's some definition of what types of trees there are. But the, the economy, the economy of the watercoloring itself, I was very happy with it. I'm particularly pleased with this. Uh, and also the strong shapes that are part of this particular thing. So, uh, and then lastly, this is uh, a tree that I had done uh, over, uh, over a couple of mornings uh, on Pleasant Street in Nantucket. Uh, and what really struck me was the age of this tree. Uh, uh, the American Indians used to call trees of this age or 100 years or older, they used to call them grandfather trees. So when I see trees like this, Anywhere, you know, I can relate to them as grandfather trees because they've been around for decades and decades, generations, and they, you know, they could be 100 years old, 200 years old, but uh, I could say Nantucket is littered with trees like this. <laughs> they have, they, they got it together, maybe because, you know, the fact that they decided way back, you know, after the whaling industry died and they were in a fallow period that Nantucket was going to be a vacation destination that they were going to play up on its history and, you know, be able to preserve, you know, the, the, uh, the, the character of the town itself, you know, its, its storied past, and, you know, be able to use that as the appeal for, uh, you know, for getting tourists to the island, which they were very successful at doing. Uh, but they also had to have the control for being able to maintain trees like this that are, you know, crowding, lifting sidewalks, you know, crowding into streets, you know, and, but they provide, you know, phenomenal amount of shade, you know, for the, this particular residential area, which actually is a, is a, a bus route too, by the way, because I was painting uh, under a bus shelter because it was very, very hot and I needed shade. When I'm working on, on, the path, on my easel, by the way, I always find a spot where I'm in the shade because if I'm working in the sun and the sun is drying the watercolors too quickly, then it becomes a problem for me, you know, to be able to keep the washes loose, to be able to work wet on wet, and you know, have the interaction of colors one with another. Uh, as I'm doing the work, it, it gets compromised by having by, by working in the sun. I have done that uh, in, in some instances, and it's not very satisfactory. Uh, it makes one work even quicker. So. Uh, but anyway, so the, the gnarled trunk in here was what really attracted me. The background of the shadows cast by the, the spreading branches of the tree and the leaves and whatnot was uh, su suggested here for the, uh, the residence that was uh, uh, behind where the tree was and, and uh, whose fence it was here, and then the adjacent neighbor back here. So the idea to get some depth using you know, those basically flat surfaces, but a little bit of perspective in here and some perspective coming back that way. So it you know, still brought the attention this way, even though they're part of the background and they have their own level of interest. But the interest in here was you know, the, 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 the gnarled shape and the curve in here and the bump outs on the, on the trunk itself, uh, the way it overlapped into the uh, sidewalk and some of the growth, the ground growth you know, at the base of the tree itself, some new growth coming out. Uh, from the bottom of the trunk itself, and then the dense vegetation, shadowed vegetation up in the uh, upper reaches of it. Um, I had done something similar to this. This was a um, this was done prior to a, uh, a similar view of a an old elm tree up in Castine, Maine, which was also another plein air sponsored event. In Castine, Maine, uh, they take great pride in preserving old elm trees. And it was an elm tree of this scale and this magnitude, and I just painted the trunk like this with an old, you know, uh, 18th century uh, structure behind it. You know, uh, a lot of the houses and residences up there are, uh, you know, been very well maintained. Uh, they've had a lot of famous authors and other, you know, residents that lived up in uh, Castine, Maine. Anyway, so that, that, was, a, uh, that was awarded a, a prize just doing the basic trunk of an elm tree. And, it, you know, and it's not unlike what Sylvia had done here, for example, uh, on, the, on the left of, of where I am, you know, showing the trunk and you know, just the, sort of the, the, the substantive nature of, of trees and what they do and how they can you know, connect with us. Um, but the, 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 the skill set to be able to you know, put all this stuff together this way you know, is something that I've been fortunate to be able to develop <coughs> and work you know, successfully in a, in a long, in, in many different events. Um, the, another story about the, uh, the, the different painters that come to these different plein air events. There was one time when I was painting in um, uh, Eastern Maryland on Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and uh, Eastern Maryland it sponsors a plein air event. It's sort of the gold standard for these type of paint events in the country. So uh, one of the few times that I was 
selected to be there uh, and paint with some of these great artists from all over the country. Uh, there was a, uh, an oil painter from Brooklyn, New York, uh, whose work I've seen since. Uh, anyway, we were painting on this huge estate that was, you know, was a mile long, okay, and this sponsoring couple that owned the property that was also sponsoring the event, you know, happened to invite artists onto their property. Anyway, I was coming along and, and I saw this artist in the corner and he was painting, you know, painting on, 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 a, on a panel, you know, a little bit smaller than this, an oil painting. And I oh, yeah, you know, introduced one another and said, yeah, so you're going to be working in oil painting? Yeah, I said, so what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to work in watercolor. Said, Whoa, so you really got to know what you're doing to paint in watercolor. I said, okay. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I mean, it's like what? I mean, the oil painters get it, you know. And and uh, there, it, it's it's surprising the uh, the the uh, sort of the, the 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 balance, I guess, uh, in these plein air events where more watercolorists are getting invited, being involved, as opposed to the oil painters who are very crafty and very good at what they do. Uh, but it's uh, it was nice to get that kind of compliment. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is I, uh, I'm going to talk to my salesperson uh, in my Shameless Commerce division. <laughs> ah, by the way, uh, okay, now I, I have brought in some of these things, so okay. any of you can, you know, uh, please yeah. help yourself to that. Uh, some of these, uh, Don and Aaron at the Shoreside Cafe have uh, been fortunate to allow me to put a rack. Uh, uh, rack cards like this uh, in their shop. Um, but I also uh, have been working uh, off and on, but now a bit more formally with uh, John Munson at Beacon Galleries for some of these new uh, wave and watercolor series that I'm working on for him, uh, smaller watercolor drawings. Uh, but also as a, a bit of a thank you for all of you to come, uh, I'd like to at least uh, have you take your selection of uh, some cards that I also produce. Okay, so uh, there were a number of, uh, this one was done in uh, Done in Chester, Vermont, um, and this this was this was a, a piece that was done. This was an, an old barn, and the the uh, son and daughter-in-law, I think that was it, uh, of the owner of the farm, who was 99 years old and blind and couldn't wow. manage the farm anymore. Okay, was was considering donating it to the town of Westport uh, in order to uh, turn it into a community theater. So they came over, they saw me painting this, and it was done, actually it was part of a workshop that I was taking with another well-known artist instructor. Um, and uh, they came over and saw this half underway and said, well, we'd like to buy this painting from you. So I <laughs> hurried up and finished it and ended up buying it. So, uh, and uh, the, this, is, this is an example of an uh, architectural illustration. I did this for the Shaolin, uh, Shaolin Lu Center in Rockport. So this is the interior view of the concert hall. Uh, they have uh, in display in their ticket office, by the way, across from the theater itself, uh, they have uh, very large uh, uh, reproductions of the paintings I had done for this project. They're, 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 they're as big as the, uh, the painting out in the, uh, out in the front there of the, uh, the one from Georgia. But anyway, that's the, the view, the, the evening view and the piano performance at Shell and News Center. Um, and these are other ones that I had done in Vermont. Uh, waterfall here, another one of a bridge in, in Lake Area. And uh, this is an example I was sort of referring to it earlier when talking about John Singer Sargent and doing water subjects and whatnot. So this is a view, this is a gift to my host family. These plein air events, the uh, part of the, the appeal for getting the artists to go to these different places around the country is they have sponsors that become host families. So they have residents in these particular areas that will put the artists up. And generally, you know, the host families are quite well off. Uh, in the case of this particular company, it was, he was a, re a retired military man, uh, a retired Navy man, actually, and his wife, and they had a beautiful home uh, in, um, uh, in, where is it, Maryland? Yeah, it was in Maryland. So, uh, anyway, so this is their backyard. They had their own private dock and this little canoe. <laughs> so, I, you know, after the program was completed, I ended up going down there and painting this view, looking down the stairs and out into their uh, community area here. Uh, and this is, an, this is an example of uh, another painting during the play year event up in Marblehead. This is in Abbott Hall, this is a number of years ago. This is uh, when Abbott Hall was being, the brickwork on the tower was being restored. So I was fascinated not only by the architecture, which I've painted many times, but also with the scaffolding and the structure of the scaffolding and the way the light was coming through this one material, but expressing in opacity and transparency and shading and, you know, it just was fantastic. So I spent all afternoon and got totally sunburned working on this. <laughs> but anyway, so this came out quite well. 
Uh, and that piece ended up uh, being purchased by a contractor. And this one's a commission piece I just oh, recently wow. did uh, down oh, at um, down at uh, the behind uh, my house. Yes, down, <laughs> office, 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 yeah. Yeah. down at uh, yeah. uh, Pico Beach. Oh, Pico. You're looking back towards uh, towards Watertower Hill. So anyway, so yeah, you're welcome to take uh, you know any one of these that you'd like at some of the brochures. One way to learn as well is you know doing live demos so i've done you know over 45 different demos for art groups you know in and around this area and also for a uh, national event in uh, eastern maryland uh, so you know doing a plein air uh, uh, demo like that uh, is you know pretty daunting especially when it's in front of other artists and other you know accomplished painters so uh, one needs to be on top of their stuff and again it's done much more quickly even than some of this stuff so um, the, the demo work is a uh, another aspect of practice, I guess, or capability. Uh, I didn't feel, I, I felt comfortable doing that because I've been doing demos during my watercolor workshop, my watercolor workshops anyway, when I was doing uh, quite a number of them uh, in, uh, in Boston. So that is a, uh, another aspect of, uh, you know, refining one's skill set. But the plein, air, the plein Air experience is something that is virgin. I know the publisher of Plein Air magazine and I've had my um, works uh, in, published in Plain Air magazine on a number of occasions. Had a feature article actually a number of years ago, uh, and the, the publisher has been very proactive, uh, excellent salesman. Uh, so he is promoting the magazine, promoting the Plain Air movement, having sponsored Plain Air events around the country. Uh, you know, he's had them in uh, in Maryland, in California, in uh, Arizona. Uh, next one is Adam in Arcadia, actually a special targeted events. He's also sponsored plenty of trips uh, to uh, Russia and uh, in Cuba. So, I mean, so there's opportunities that you know that one has the resources, of course, you know, to take off for a week or two and paint in these other you know exotic locales. But, but most art, plein air artists, you know, they're painting plein air wherever they are. It doesn't matter. You know, going to the events is nice because there's a camaraderie of the different artists that you know do know one another from around the country. I have a number of friends, you know, just here in the New England region that are you know very active in uh, the plein air world, if you will. Uh, but you know, that's it, it's. It's a, uh, a, a, a different type of pursuit. It's not really a career. Most of the artists that are doing this are retired or they have you know, a successful you know, uh, business that affords them the opportunity to do that, which is the case for me. Because uh, I mean, there's travel involved. If somebody lives in the East Coast and they have to go in the middle of the country in order to go to a plein air event, even though they're hosted by a family, there's still you know, travel costs and whatnot and the expense of you know, all of the, uh, the, 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 the palace, the frames, the paints, and everything else. They may or may not sell. They may or may not get an award. So they spend all of that money, have a nice vacation for themselves, but then, <laughs> then bringing back a lot of paintings that you know, they, they, they're going to have to figure out how to display them or sell them. So, which said, you know, all of these are for sale too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> another, another shameless commerce pitch. But uh, no, but I, I appreciate your attending and you know, hearing some of you know the background of what it is that I do and uh, getting a little more insight into you know how these works are actually done. So they, they don't appear magically. It, it is the result of a lot of hard work, a lot of experience, you know, and a lot of you know sort of drive, I guess, you know, to be able to connect with the subject matter. In this case, trees. And you know, be able to at least you know show examples of trees that you know of whatever kind you know we may be able to bring more of that into Winthrop, and be able to help underwrite your win and, and the tree committees, the new tree, the new Winthrop Love Trees group. You know, they're trying to implement things like down at the landing, for example, and other places in town. So, uh, I thank you for coming at the tail end of this exhibit. Uh, take one of these brochures, one of the cards, and uh, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So, thank you all very much. This is great.